The average yearly income of the 10,000 inshore fishermen in Nova Scotia from turn of the century until the early 1940s was less than $100 per year. In 1939, fishermen and plant workers in Lockport on the south shore of Nova Scotia attempted to raise their heads in dignity. The provincial government and large fish companies responded with starvation tactics, RCMP strike breaking, and the jailing of union organizers. Ralph Bell, later the founder of National Sea Products, owned the Lockport Cold Storage Fish Company throughout the Depression. Leon Williams, a fish plant worker then, remembers him well. Why would he say, boys? Yes, Mr. Bell. He get it all figured out. Fine, boy. So sit on the last bit, give you a little cut in wages. He was only getting about a dollar and eighty cents a day then. Lockport fishermen, such as Ben McKenzie, had to leave homes in the 1930s to make a living. They went to New England, where American fishermen's unions had won higher prices paid for fish catches. Aware of trade union powers, Ben McKenzie returned home in 1937 and established a local of the Fishermen's Federation in Lockport. In 1937, the provincial liberal government of Angus L. Macdonald had passed Nova Scotia's first trade union act. However, the unsuccessful strikes in 1938 by Halifax fish handlers and Lunenburg fishermen proved the weakness of both the trade union act and the Fishermen's Federation. Seeing the need for a strong fishermen's union in Lockport, Ben McKenzie contacted the Canadian Seamen's Union, which had the charter to organize Canadian fishermen. In August 1939, McKenzie, with the aid of Canadian Seamen's Union organizers Charles Murray and Pat Sullivan, organized Locals 1 and 2 of the Canadian Fishermen and Fish Handlers Union in Lockport. Norman Anderson, fish plant worker, was a member of the 1939 Lockport Union. So anything that you've done then, back in, in, in the 30s, in regards to unionism, you were automatically branded as a communist. Yeah. I know Ben McKinsey and Bob Williams and, and uh, John Stewart and all these men. And they said about them all, they're all communists, these people. Don't have nothing to do with them, <laughs> but uh, that was their idea of, uh, of, of uh, what what the the communist people were trying to do: disrupt the industry, put us all in in, in the poorhouse, so to speak, and then eventually get us down to the place where we they just walk in and take us over, turn us slaves, turn it turn us into slaves, even worse than what we really were then. <laughs> the Lockport Company, owned by the Smith interests of Lunenburg and Swim Brothers Limited, refused to recognize the union. On October 21st, 1939, they locked out the workers, saying they were going out of business. One of the union's organizers was Charles Murray. During the Depression, he, like thousands of others in this country, had joined the Canadian Communist Party. By 1939, he had helped organize 6,000 fishermen in this province into the Canadian Fishermen's Union. In 1939, the biggest fish companies in Nova Scotia, I mean, the Lockport Coal Storage was about the third biggest. The biggest of all was the National Fish in Halifax, the next biggest was uh, Lunenburg, and uh, the General Seafoods in Lockport came in third, fourth, something like that. And without a doubt, and you read, you read the newspaper accounts at the time, and it's very, very clear and obvious that the companies, particularly Swim Brothers here, they, they didn't have their heart in, in breaking the union. They were just following the instructions. They'd been bloody well threatened. Either you break the you don't either lock those people out and keep them out, don't make an agreement with them, or you'll have to account to us. Who's us? Us was the other fish companies. So there was a They were the people they were the people that 
talked to Angus L. MacDonald and told him what to do. Companies like the workers of To combat the Fish Buyer Association's conspiracy of lockout and starvation, the union fought back. It took over an abandoned plant and started a fish processing cooperative, selling the fish to supportive unions in Cape Breton. The Annie Ganish Cooperative Movement refused all Lockport requests for administrative assistance. Spokesperson D.L. Ringer appealed across the province for food, warm clothing for children, and milk for the 11 babies born since the lockout had begun. Errol Williams was a fish plant worker of the 1939 Lockport Union. What about the companies at that time? Were, companies? were they worried about the men? Worried? My friend, they, wouldn't, they couldn't care less. They was worried about that, that dollar. That's what they was worried about. That was the thing that was concerned them most. They didn't care. I remember having fish for Christmas dinner. That's what it was. We would sit down sometimes, right? nine boys and three girls, mother and father, 14 of us, family. But the old man years ago had to go to the States, go to another country to try to make a living for the family. Go away from home, pay taxes in this place. You tell about arcade, what, what, do, you, what, do, you, what do you, there's the, there's the, there's the, there's the, there's the story. You young men, you, 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 I mean, I couldn't, I, it's in my mind, but I can't, ex I can't tell you, I can't express it to you. In October of 1978, Charles Murray was invited by history teacher George Perry to speak with Lockport High School students. The students' questions centered on why the Lockport fish companies had locked out the workers so soon after the union was formed. There's only so much pie. And if the employees organize the union and they want a bigger slice of the pie, somebody takes less. And the people who have been getting practically the whole pie all along, they want to continue getting practically the whole pie. And most of them will stop at absolutely nothing, including lies. According to my sources, you arrived in Lockport approximately two to three weeks before the lockout began. And they also say that the fishermen and the fish handlers in this town were getting along fine with their own union, minding their own business, and getting along quite well with the management. And according to them, you spurred on this lockout and you caused the lockout, you and Pat Sullivan, by your arrival and you trying to, to work out this thing with the workers. Is there any truth in this? Look, one of the things was Pat Sullivan and his chief interest, because he didn't know a fisherman from nothing, but what, he was the president of the Canadian Seamen's Union and there was every reason to believe that a whack of a lot of Nova Scotia fishermen were going to be taken up to the lakes as scabs to break the Canadian Seamen's Union. And he believed that if the fishermen were organized and got decent conditions down here and so on, and that they were members of the trade union movement along with the sailors on the lakes, that they would not go up and act as scabs. Which is a reasonable assumption, eh? This was one reason why he was interested here. One reason why I was interested here is I am a Nova Scotian, my father was a Nova Scotian, and my grandfather became a Nova Scotian in 1850. One of the things that I saw long before the strike, uh, maybe in 1935 or 36, a guy was uh, working, there was fish guts on the floor, there was uh, uh, cracked ice on the floor, and he was working in his bare feet, in the cracked ice and fish curry. Well, you know, Nova Scotians don't go on their bare feet in cracked ice if they got shoes to wear, eh? It was intimidation, 
They wanted you to work. There was no such a thing as hours on the clock. They called you in two o'clock in the morning. There's a man standing in the door there. That would verify that. And two o'clock in the morning, you worked all them. There was no overtime and chi coolie wages, Chinese wages. So these gentlemen here that come here, I got the greatest admiration and respect regardless of their politics or religion, like you say. That's a man's prerogative. That's a man's right or anybody else's right. So these people come here to try to alleviate the, the, the condition that people were in in Lockport to try to get a little better working conditions, a little more money. People was in debt to the stores, taxes, and everything else. And it was only a legitimate reason that they should have a chance, a fair shake, not be intimidated or exploited, which was the case. Throughout the eight-week lockout, Trains hired by the fish companies tried to remove fish from the fish plants. They were stopped each time by the 24-hour picket line maintained by Lockport men and women. The train, they, they, they tell us they blow a whistle and the housewives would go sometime while your head was braided, most of them, and they'd leave it burning and they'd come down and stand on the picket line. And he'd come so far, we'd stand with the flag between the cars and the, the head people would say, take her in, take the cars out. They'd have them loaded up with fish and everything. They thought they'd break us. And we'd stand between the couplings of cars and Happy Linux and Mary Vish would say, that's as far as I'm taking her. If you want to go take her. And they'd take her out. They never took anything. Captain Norman Smith. The way there was many women as there was men, when they when, when seen something was going to happen like that when the man was here, they'd all come over here. Probably 150 people would be here. I don't know for sure, I never counted them, but the railroad track from up here, the railroad, the cars would be right where we're standing here, and right up beyond the plant, and the train would be coming down and you'd be standing between us. And there's the alleyway where Tom McLean drove up here and dragged my brother and Harry Hicks. Could you tell us just a bit about uh, Harry Hicks? Harry Hicks was, was an aggressive man, he went fights for his country, a man can do no more and not give his life for, for, for his friends, that's what they've done, that's what a lot of them done, a lot of them are still over there. And uh, I was turned down, I volunteered too, I was turned down for it. So uh, they were still laying over there, and that's what they tried to starve him to death and run him down, run him, run him, run him down, the cars. Dragged him right up here, after a while he got off the car, one fellow said if I'd have had a gun he wouldn't have got clear, no he wouldn't have either. Did they ever uh, prosecute the company for doing that? Prosecute. Man, they prosecute them. Well, they'd give them a medal for that. If they killed some of us, they'd give them a medal for it. No, nothing like that. Parker Melanson and Bobby Williams, Jr. were fishermen who were locked out in 1939. <laughs> no, come here, Bobby. No, go ahead. Come here, Bobby. Go ahead, you're older than uh, I am. Well, his father, his father was fishing at the time. Oh, yeah. Trying my, to bring up a big family. Well, he had and, nine and boys the, and three girls. When the lockout, when they put the lockout on, well, they made it bad for the shore people, too. You know, the people who were working in the plants, they had to quit, too. Well, there was a few that stayed in, scabs. They didn't want to, they was a kind of against us, you see. I'd name them off, but I, I don't like to. Right up there was... Uh, where I pulled the uh, distributor off of Norman, uh, off of, uh, what's his name, uh, Captain Norman uh, from Barrington, you know, Captain Norman. Norman Smith. Norman. Yeah, but, <laughs> but while, was, while the strike was on, we, we wasn't uh, outrageous. We, no, we, we were didn't sensible. do any harm. We, we were sensible, sensible, sure. We were sensible, and yeah. All, all we wanted was living. We, we, uh, Stayed up in the in the union hall over Bally store, and uh, they relieved the pickets every two hours. They stayed there all night. You had your turn to go down for two hours. Some went to Swim Brothers and some went to to Lockport Company. And uh, time by time, they tried to get trucks out. They loaded trucks down here, and they loaded trucks to to to, uh, to uh, Lockport Company. And they 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 uh, pulled the drivers out. And, kick the windows out of them, stop them, whichever way they could. And finally, they, they brought the, the amount of police in here. I think they were a, a picked a bunch, a, a riot squad, so to speak. 
and they come with, with long, long billies and, and uh, prepared to, to, to beat us off the railroad track. So we got it there in strength. And uh, some of the younger ones, like myself, that was good at throwing rocks, get up on the hill, what they called it Calward's Hill at that time. He had a house there with pockets full of big rocks to throw. And the others stood on the picket line and, and some had clubs and some had pieces of two by four. And, and uh, they met the Mounties and, and uh, it developed into a, a real, you know, we say ding dong battle. There was men from Gunnan Cove, there was men from Cape Island, there was about 600 men here, all together. The train was pulling in up here at the cold storage, they had three carloads of fish up there to pull out. And I was one of the birds that was on the track, and poor old crowbar... I couldn't have moved too far away. Poor old crowbar was standing on the coupling, singing God Save the King. Yeah. And I was on the track and there was about 50 head around my waist like that and this man who was trying to haul me off. And I grabbed his tunic like that. I said, you, you go ahead and pull. And they was pulling behind me. I could feel my stomach stretching. And by and by the button started flew. He said, fly. He said, Jesus. He said, I can't get you over there. I said, forget it. Just about that time, a bunch of women was up there on the hill and Denver Levy, and this mount, he got into a chew over something and he started to pull his gun, hmm. right? And they had these whips with them. And then and, and, and Sealy Turner? Yeah, and... Shove the old hat pin in. The head fellow said, put your guns away. Use your... the whips they had, hmm. whatever you call them. I don't know what they were, anyhow. So Denver said, take off your tunic, drop the whip, and he said, I'll show you what I'll do with you. Denver Levy, you remember Denver Levy? Oh, yeah. I Ernest Levy's brother. Yeah, he, could do, he could do it, too. Mm. And just about that time, he stooped over for do something, and Florence Turner struck him. You, <laughs> he, you know what I think about the whole thing? With his hat You know what I think about the whole thing? Lockport. And, and all the rest of fishing villages right. and the fishing industry. Yeah. So much better off than when me and you had to go. Les McKenzie, son of Captain Ben McKenzie, was a fish plant worker who was locked out in 1939. What was I arrested for? Yeah. Of obstructing the law. Well, those big mounties would pick me up and they'd throw me about 30 or 40 feet out across the road and I'd, and I'd crawl back and then they'd pick me up again and they'd throw me. Well, then they started to get a little rough. And that was around the time that Walt here was telling us about the one mount he pulled his pistol. And as, as it happened, the, the, the mount he in charge, he carries a little stick in his hand or something. When he pulled the pistol, he hit him over the hand with the, with the stick and he dropped the pistol. And then after that, they pulled the mounties out. That's the time that went on. Well, then we were all arrested. My mother was never outside the house at the time, the strike or the pick, uh, on, on the picket line up there. And Dad and myself and my mother and the one colored woman, Florence Turner, we were subpoenaed to appear in court. My mother wasn't even, yeah. wasn't even know the host. Anything to break up the union. It shall be lawful for employees to form a union of their choice. It don't say of the company's choice, but their choice. The law that you supported, that you put in politics for that reason. We was only going by what, what it read. And to join the same when formed and to bargain collectively yeah. with their employer. PC 1003, still the same. You're saying, and, you're saying some of you are ready to die for that, is what well, uh, that, I am what, 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 that yeah. would have happened? Why, of course. Yeah. Of course you would. Well, you, what's the difference between starving to death and, 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 and being shot? See, we had nowhere to go. What up? Wasn't getting enough out of it anyway, were you? You couldn't, you couldn't work on another condition much longer. And we listened to these old fellows. They, they're not what, old compared now. I'm old, but uh, Captain Ben McKenzie, a competent man. Dwight Ringer, a good man. And my father was a good man. And John Stewart was a, the, the, the supervisor's father here. He's dead now. But yeah, good man. Don't, don't take any act of violence, boys. It'll hurt you. You know, we've seen how much you could take. We'll get this thing straightened out. And they thought the government would make the companies recognize a union that was, was legal. No. They wasn't going to do it, like, keep them under your ear, put, let them rise their heads. That's what it was. But we weren't, we weren't violent people in those days. We were. Fishermen, 
the fishermen, as, as Les says, are not violent people. Point one. Mm -hmm. uh, they elected representatives to the government they th that they honestly believed, as they had always been told, that these people would look after their interests. They, they, they had already received a rude awakening. Uh, look, there were lots of things discussed by the executive of the Union. One of the things which I think helped to prevent the Mounties from being more violent, because the Mounties have been violent in many, many cases. They have used their guns yeah. and, and so on. The threat of losing a million dollars worth of fish on account of a chunk of a chain being tossed over the power line, eh? I think went a long way toward preventing the violence. There was never any danger of violence from the fishermen. Mm -hmm. The violence, if it was going to come, would come from. And there was, look, is it violent to leave, to, to, to create a condition which makes a kid starve? Is that violence? Of course it's violence. It's just the same kind of violence as if you took a stick and beat the kid over the head. And this was the kind of violence that was used by the companies and by the government in Nova Scotia against the fishermen. Yeah. But if the fishermen had responded as was suggested by our brother, look, they would have had to beat all the Mounties in Canada and the Canadian Army, and by gosh, if they, if they showed signs of doing that, which of course is ridiculous, they would have had to beat the American Marines too. Walter West, executive member of the Lockport Fishermen's Union in 1939. Like Les said here, uh, we knew we couldn't win when we seen what we were up again. On December 15th, 1939, the government maneuvered the union into settlement. When the plants reopened, the buyers again refused to recognize the union. Ben McKenzie, Bob Williams Sr., and many others were blacklisted from employment. The young men of Lockport signed up for another battle. It wound up that uh, the majority of the boys who were working at the plant had to either go fishing somewhere else or enlist in the army, which I did, and a lot of more of my friends. The three of us that were old enough volunteered to go in the service and try to make a living because you couldn't live the way it was. Uh, there was three boys right, well, just about next door to me that never returned, and they were kids. A list of those who have wreaths to be laid at the monument this morning. <coughs> the Nova Scotia government. What happened to Harry Hicks over, overseas? We he was killed overseas, Rosa Marina. It was in August he was killed, Harry was. And his chum here that was with us, Lionel Williams, a chum of mine too, he carried him out. It was quite a rough go at that time. That was down in Sicily that he was killed. And uh, he was a good fella, a hard worker. He was a good fella, a good athlete. And we even advertised the fish. He had the Lockport sea caps on her back, didn't we? Advertised fish for him everywhere, all over Halifax and, and everywhere else, Middleton, all over Nova Scotia. The sea caps, a heavy team, big team. Won the shield and pennant and cup for years for him. I used to pitch for him. He was a catcher. And the Huskelson boys, all of them, all good ball players, had a, a good team. Right after the lockout, 
how many of the young fellers, the young people who was old enough to go in the service, said, well, there's nothing else we can do. We can't make a living no other way. We'll have to go. It wasn't bravery, Bob. No. Was it? It was no bravery on nobody's part because you well, no, And how many young fellers left Lockport here? I was in my 30s then. Lot I left. A lot of them. A lot of them, yes. I left to make a living. Well, so you couldn't make a fishing. After the Lockport organizing work continued. On June 10th, 1940, Captain Ben McKenzie and Charles Murray wrote a letter on behalf of Local Number 1 of the Canadian Fishermen's Union to the Lockport Company, Swim Brothers, Shelburne Fisheries, and the Nickerson Brothers, asking them to negotiate herring prices with that union. Instead of receiving a letter from the companies, Charles Murray received a letter from Nova Scotia's Labour Minister, L.D. Curry. I warn you now to desist from your efforts to create industrial trouble. And I warn you, too, that your conduct will from now on be very carefully watched and examined. And if I find that you do not quit this sort of business, then it will be most certainly the worst for you. I am giving you this final word of warning. On the morning of September 29, 1940, his wife due to give birth, Charles Murray was arrested by the RCMP under Section 23 of Canada's War Measures Act. He was interned with German, French, and Italian fascists, other leftists, and labor organizers. He served one year and four months without a trial. In the concentration camp, somebody asked me about this, this how important, and apparently it's very, very important to you, as whether I was a communist or not. At the time, it was not important to the fishermen in Lockport. It was important to the fish companies because they could use this as a weapon to beat the fishermen. Hey? Eh? That was why it was important to them, and the only reason it was important to them. Look, I had a hearing, which I was entitled to 16 months before I got it, according to the law of Canada, eh? the Defense War Managers Act. Finally, I had a hearing. In that hearing, nobody at any time I said, are you a communist? Nobody said, were you a communist? Nobody said, are you going to be a communist? What they did say is, do you think that the fishermen's union in Lockport is sufficiently broken that it can't be revived again now? That's what they asked me, and that's what they were interested in, and that's why I was in a concentration camp, period. With Murray interned and the workers at war, Ralph Bell was in Ottawa, associating with Canada's corporate elite. In 1945, Bell organized the 24 largest fish companies in Nova Scotia, into the National Sea Monopoly. Finally, in 1952, plant workers at the Lockport Company, now owned by National Sea, were organized by Errol Williams and Norman Anderson. So we did accomplish a lot more than people realized in 1939, because uh, the companies felt that we would put up another, another fight. And uh, uh, we didn't only make it better for ourselves here, we made it better for, for fish handlers and fishermen in other areas. The struggle of fishermen and plant workers to build a strong union has continued with the same determination as that of the men and women of Lockport in 1939. The people of Lockport have been told that their fish plant will close on October 1st, 1989. On the 50th anniversary of the Lockport lockout, the very survival of hundreds of communities along the coast of Atlantic Canada is at stake. Ah, and I'm only a young man yet. I might go, I might go sword fishing yes. if I can get a boat good enough next summer, I might go. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. Go on, I'll take you. I can, I can, I, if I can't do nothing else, I can cook. <laughs> I can run an engine. Well, you go engineer. I can run an engine, Brady. <laughs> That's one thing I can yeah. do. <laughs> I remember what the old dad used to tell me when we come on making the land.